Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jason Mercer, and I'll be your host today. Today's webinar is about achieving advanced nutrient removal capabilities in wastewater treatment plants, presented by my colleague, Rika Lashley. Rika will cover a case study of the Butte, Montana membrane bioreactor, which was upgraded in 2016 to achieve very low effluent nutrient concentrations. Rika is a professional engineer with 14 years of experience in environmental engineering. In 2012-2013, Rika was instrumental during design of the Butte Wastewater Treatment Plant upgrades, particularly for the fine screening facility and the bioreactors. Rika is the current president of MWEA and an active member of AWWA and lives in Helena with her family. Before we begin, I want to mention just a couple routine housekeeping items. If anyone has any questions during today's presentation, you can submit them through the questions panel on your webinar interface, and we will answer as many as we can after the presentation. Today's webinar will also be recorded and posted to our website later this week, and we will post today's PowerPoint slides if you'd like to access those as well. If you are an engineer seeking PDH credits, this session may meet requirements for PDHs depending on your professional registration and or certification requirements. If you are an operator seeking continuing education credits, this session is approved for 0.1 CECs. If you would like a certificate of participation to validate your attendance, please email Jenna Comstock, jcomstock at m-m.net to request one. Okay, without further ado, I will pass the controls to Rika Rika, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm here, and I would rather be somewhere with you guys and standing in front of you all um, talking than talking to my computer screen. That is a little bit odd. Um, meanwhile, maybe I can imagine you, maybe you can imagine me waving my hands as I'm talking. So we're going to take a look at the Butte plant. Um, here's a, literally an overview. Um, I'll just go a quick over how flow goes through the plant. Comes in on the bottom right where the headworks arrow points to the headworks that are not quite shown. There's a coarse screen and grid removal. Then flow continues to the EQ basin. Um, that allows flow to be delivered to the process a little more equally with less peaks and valleys. From there, it's pumped to the fine screen turbo compressor building. And the turbo compressors are for airflow, but the fine screens are two millimeter internally fed rotary drum screens. And they are instrumental in protecting the membranes downstream from materials that could damage them. Then flow goes by gravity to the bioreactor. That's where we'll be spending quite a bit of time today. And then onto the membranes where it gets filtered. Um, these are ultra filtration membranes, so very fine. And from there it's discharged. Um, these membranes actually provide an effective barrier to bacteria and to many viruses. And so the plant at this point is not um, running their UV disinfection system, but they do have it and keep it maintained um, in case they need it. So first, here's a few numbers, and we'll revisit those, revisit those throughout. So the new service, the, the upgraded fancy new service that they, uh, process that they have was taken into service in 2016. The first half was taken into service that was only two bioreactor trains in February, and then the other half was taken into service in October or September. And by October, November, the process was fully established. And for nutrient data, we'll be looking at data from the summer seasons of 2017, 18, and 19. And then we will take a brief look at metals data, and that data goes back to 2007. Um, so it's a nice long-term view we're getting there. And then just to put things into perspective, the overall current average plant flow is 3.9 MGD, and the full build-out of this plant um, would be 5.5 MGD, and those uh, average flow also. And here are some influent numbers for total phosphorus, about 3.7 milligrams per liter. That's fairly low and mainly due to 
the ban of um, phosphorus containing detergents and soaps and so forth. Influent total nitrogen at 28 milligrams per liter, and then we have influent copper at 99 micrograms per liter, and influent zinc at 295 micrograms per liter. You don't have to remember those, we'll get, we'll get back to them. So here's a closer look at the bioreactor. Flow comes, as I mentioned, from the fine screens and continues to the bioreactor. And the bioreactor is divided into four trains. So we have a central corridor where flow is collected and split. And then there's these four trains that you see. And from the fine screens, flow ends up in this splitter box and is then piped to each process train. And these trains are set up in a, in a there and back configuration. So there's very long skinny basins. Um, this approximates plug flow as much as possible. And that is a very efficient way, effective way to treat wastewater. So when we come back between this last and this first cell in each train, there's a recycle stream. And then also RAS is returned into the central area. And there's four gates, one to each train, process train and actually goes through a channel under these covers and then is delivered into the second cell in each train. And we'll get to that again. And from, from there, from the bioreactor, the flow continues to the, to the membranes. This is a busy figure, but what I wanna point out here is this influent, oh, I am sorry. This influent corresponds to the bioreactor splitter box and then underneath those covers that you saw, each process train has seven cells. The first one is not aerated. Then there's three aerated cells, three non-aerated cells, and then flow continues to the membranes in the, other, in the next building over. And there are two points of possible chemical addition right here between the aerated and non-aerated zone and just before going to the membranes. But to talk about process, I simplified this a little bit. So that first cell you saw that's not aerated is corresponds to this box as either anaerobic or anoxic. The aerated cells are the aerobic zone. Then the following three unaerated cells are this anoxic zone, and then we go to the membranes. And before I get into more detail, I just want to present the processes that happen in these in these zones. Now this is an overview of these processes. One could make an entire presentation out of explaining each one of them, but I'm just gonna summarize them here as best as I can. In the anaerobic zone, it mainly exists to create conditions that allow so-called phosphorus accumulating organisms to release phosphorus. And they will do that if they have a readily available carbon source there. They're usually volatile fatty acids. They can be in the influent, they can be made by fermenters and such, but I'm just gonna refer to them as PAO candy or just candy. It's something that goes down quick and they like it. Um, when they have enough of it, they store it. They put it in their pockets, under their shirts, in their boots, everywhere. They eat as much of it as they can. And in return, they release phosphorus. That's what they normally store as an energy source but when they have candy, who needs another source? So that gets released. Then the anaerobic zones followed by the aerobic or aerated zone. And here we have three processes. There are heterotrophic bacteria that like to eat carbon and lots of it. And they use dissolved oxygen for respiration. So the carbon is what we commonly refer to as BOD. So these are the guys that get rid of the BOD for us. And of course we need to air it to supply them with enough oxygen so they can do their work. And then the second process is nitrification where autotrophic bacteria convert ammonia to nitrate. They don't use BOD, they use dissolved carbon dioxide as a food source, so they don't need BOD, but they also use dissolved oxygen in the water for respiration. So they still also need the air bubbled into those cells to, to do their job and then they bind lots of that oxygen um, to the nitrogen that's, that they get from the ammonia and leave that behind for us to deal with. 
And the third process that happens in the aerobic zone is that these PAOs that stored away all that candy in their pockets and their boots and under their shirts pull that out and eat it because they don't have it in this zone. And they're panicking a little bit and they're like, oh my gosh, we need to store something for energy. And they take up a lot of the phosphorus and more that they released previously. So for some reason, if we feed them well in the anaerobic zone, they are capable of taking up more phosphorus than they released in, in the aerobic zone. And that is how they remove it from the wastewater. And then the anoxic zone, the third zone, um, the same heterotrophs that eat the BOD in the aerobic zone are now sitting in the anoxic zone and they still want to eat BOD, but they don't have dissolved oxygen. So they can turn to facultative respiration and they can use the oxygen attached to the nitrogen in nitrate for their respiration. So they turn that nitrate into N2 gas that just comes out of the water and, um, and, and consume more BOD. And the autotrophs and the PAOs, they just kind of hang out in the, in, in the anoxic zone without doing too much. So what does this mean for butte in particular? Um, the butte process can run in a couple of configuration, or the same configuration, but in a couple of operational modes of operation, I should say. <clears throat> During non-summer, when there are no nutrient limits to be observed. Um, there's no chemical addition and the process works as shown here. The first cell is anoxic and I actually will circle back to it with the, uh, sorry again, with the uh, mixed liquor recycle and I'm going to start right here. So in the aerobic zone, as we just talked about, we have heterotrophs eating BOD. We have autotrophs converting ammonia to nitrate and we may or may not have some of those PAOs do anything at this point. In the anoxic zone, we have lots and lots of nitrate and the heterotrophs don't find lots and lots of BOD because we consumed it all here. So when they're sitting in here, they pretty much have to wait for their neighbors to die so they can eat them, use them as BOD and in the process denitrify. So that's a very slow process. This is a very large zone. You saw there were three, three cells. It's almost half of the entire process train, but it's still not enough to, to achieve complete denitrification. So this mixed liquor recycle stream does have quite a bit of nitrate in it that makes it to this first cell. So now since we have quite a bit of nitrate in that first cell, which is a form of oxygen, this first cell does not go completely anaerobic. So it doesn't really give those PAOs the conditions that they need to release phosphorus, but it gets fresh influent with lots of BOD. And so the heterotrophs that are sitting in here or that have returned with the recycle, they're getting new food and they very quickly denitrified, denitrify a lot more of the nitrate that's still in the, in the flow right here. Now, during the summer, we need to achieve lower or effluent concentrations of both nitrogen and phosphorus. And so in this particular plant, we're gonna achieve that with chemical, addi chemical addition either here or there or both. And before I get into more detail, I'm gonna give you some info about these chemicals. Micro-C is a proprietary glycerin-based carbon source. Um, what we're doing here is adding that carbon in that, in, that nit in that anoxic zone where BOD has already been used up to provide food for these bugs. We're using micro C because micro C is a, mm, it has a, a constant formula. So we can, we can figure out what dose works and we know that dose will work at all times. Whereas if you use natural, say like brewery waste or something for one thing, it has a much lower concentration. You need a lot more of it, but it also has varying concentration. So you'd, you'd constantly be adjusting your process to, to, to try to keep it running smoothly. And when you need to achieve these very low concentrations as the butte plant does, effluent concentrations, you have to have a reliable carbon source that you can inject there. And then alum, aluminum sulfate um, is a metal salt that reacts with or orthophosphate, which is the form of phosphorus in the process. 
Um, it also reacts with other wastewater constituents and it forms a solid precipitate that can be removed with the sludge. And the membranes um, do a very good job of filtering that out. So back to the summer operation. Um, where influent comes in, again, I will circle back to this zone with, with the recycle stream here and start here again. This zone is the same as before. We have BOD removal, we have nitrification, conversion of ammonia to nitrate, and we do have PAO activity. They are eating their candy here and they are, are the stored candy, I should say. And they are storing, they are taking up phosphorus and they are doing it well. Then we move on down here. This, this BOD has been used up. We're moving here and we're adding a new carbon source for these guys. So the heterotrophs have food and they have nitrate and they're doing a great job. Um, we're getting almost, almost full denitrification to very low concentrations um, in, the, in the point point something range, less than one milligram per liter. The recycle stream now has, uh, I keep clicking my mouse button, I'm sorry, I will try not to do that again. The recycle stream has now almost no nitrate in it and it's low enough so that this first anaerobic or this first zone can go truly anaerobic. There is no oxygen in any form available, not dissolved and not in the form of nitrate. So this is where the PAOs now are encouraged very strongly to release their, um, to release their, their stored phosphate and, and eat the candy that we're providing. And the other effect of adding micro C, apparently um, these, these heterotrophs, they may not be using all of it up in that zone and some of it is being recycled. And the PEOs also like that. They like micro C just about as well as they like those volatile fatty acids. And it seems to stimulate um, phosphorus removal as well. And we'll see that in the, in the data later too. Now that was a lot of process talking, so I'm gonna relax your minds for a second. Um, and we'll take a look at, at the membrane facility because it is very cool. So this is the top of it. There are four trains. You can, at the back wall, you can see the, the silvery, um, those are, those are the, uh, the vents where, where the air escapes to the outside. The green piping is the air supply piping. So you can see there's four of them going one to each train. And then the pipe labeled as ALP, that's air low pressure, that's all the, the air supply piping. And below that is the permeate pipe that sucks the dry, and not dry, that sucks the treated and cleaned and filtered effluent out of these membranes and um, carries it on to, to the effluent. And this is a look at our piping or pumping galleries. On the right, where it's labeled permeate everywhere, that is, there are the permeate pumps and they are used both to draw the clean water out, but they're also used in a, in a reverse flows, not through the pump, with val valves, the flow is reversed through the membranes to backwash them and push any um, material that has lodged in the membrane back out. That happens at regular intervals. And then on the left, um, that's the RAS piping. And these pumps and pipes return RAS at a rate of five, five times the influent back to the aerobic zone of the bioreactor. This flow is highly aerated. It can have dissolved oxygen concentrations of five to six milligrams per liter. And so we, do, we don't want to put that in the first, in the, in the anaerobic or anoxic zone. That would certainly defeat mm, all purposes of trying to have um, phosphorus removal happening there. So that's why it's returned to the second cell, which is the, which is the first aerobic cell. And the high rate of return is because if we don't return it fast enough, the solids will actually accumulate in the membrane basins. And then they're sitting there and we don't have them in the bioreactor where we need them. So that's why 5Q seems to work well for this particular plant. And here's a bit more of a close-up view of one of those membrane cassettes. Um, each of those trains above has currently seven of these cassettes in it. Um, it can be built out to hold nine cassettes. That would be for the full build-out for the design flow of 5.5 MGD. 
So the way these work is on the bottom end right here, they're potted solidly in some sort of a resin, so they're they're tight down here. And then this whole thing sits in, in the soup. And these fibers are hollow. And at the top end up here, they're connected to the pumping system. So when the pump applies a vacuum, it sucks the clean water from, from the mixed liquor that's all around through these, through these um, fibers and into the, the hollow space inside and then out. And that is what these membrane cassettes sit in, and that is what's pumped out of them. So pretty good performance, I'd say. And that is a confused uh, construction manager, I think. He was supposed to have a zip out of this one, I think. So now we're going to look at nutrients and at nutrient removal. And so here I'm recapping some of the numbers you saw earlier. So in 2016, the new process was taken into service. First, only two trains, and then in February, and then in September, um, a third, well, two, two more trains were completed, but only one of them was ultimately taken into service. So full operation on three trains was established somewhere in October or November, so to where the process had pretty much settled in. So the data we're looking at is for the summer seasons of 2017, 18, and 19, because 2016 wasn't quite applicable yet with only two trains in service. And just a reminder, influent for total phosphorus is 3.7, for total nitrogen is 28 milligrams per liter, and that is quite a bit higher than what comes out the back end. <clears throat> so first, I decided to simply plot the data that was collected against when it was sampled. So time on the bottom, um, nitrogen concentrations are right here. Nitrogen is red, phosphorus concentrations over here, phosphorus is blue. And just to see what we could see, and it isn't a ton, in 2017, the process wasn't quite as settled in yet as later on. There were some upsets in the spring um, that probably affected things even in, into, into June and July. And so you can just see a, a greater spread right here that the clouds are a little bit more fluffy. They're not as concentrated, whereas especially the, the blue dots for 2018 and 19, the phosphorus is definitely lower um, and, and more consistent. For nitrogen, there's still a pretty good spread, but I think we can agree that the, the red dots are a little bit more lower, I guess, than here. So that's, that's good. Let's see what we can tell when we plot effluent nutrient concentrations versus temperature. I thought for sure we'll see a correlation between higher temperature and lower total nitrogen concentrations. And red is nitrogen, that's the plot on the left, and there's absolutely no correlation. Okay. I did take a peek just at 2017 data when there was no chemical addition. Same, looked the same exactly. Um, so I, I, I'm going to leave it at that. For phosphorus, um, right here there seems to be may, maybe a weak correlation. Um, the 2017 only data showed maybe a weak correlation, um, but also not much. And of course, we got to remember that in these, these graphs, the chemical addition that was done at varying doses, varying rates, and varying combinations would have probably thrown off these graphs. But temperature doesn't tell us anything. So let's graph effluent concentration versus the various scenarios of chemical addition that we tried out. So, ah, so right here, this first scenario zero is no chemical addition. There's a widespread, which is interesting because there's also some very low concentrations shown. Then these first three scenarios are alum addition and Alum doesn't really affect nitrogen all that much, except, and I'll get to that later. So these are not particularly much lower than these on the zero scenario. 
And then four, five, and six are micro C addition scenarios. They do look a little bit more consistently lower. And then seven and eight are alum and micro C addition scenarios. So if we kind of look at four through eight, which all add micro C and compare them to one or zero to three, I think we can say, yep, there's an improvement there. Now, if we look at this data on a chronological basis and we look at it with respect to what chem chemical was added when, it looks like this for 2018. One thing I want to point out here is 2018 had some really high influent flows through pretty much through the middle of July. And these flows were from runoff, from snow melt, probably groundwater too. And they diluted the influence. They also probably cooled it down a little bit. Um, but th that dilution never bodes very well for, for nutrient removal in any plant. So the data for this, this early period is, is fairly inconclusive in my opinion. As flows kind of settle down back to normal, it looks like the process established itself a little better for nitrogen. And I am still somewhat ignoring alum, although maybe maybe this process would have established itself a little bit faster had there not been alum addition. <clears throat> we'll, we'll see about that on a couple of other slides here soon. Right here is no chemical addition, flows are normal, temperatures are nice, whether or not temperature affects it, we don't know, but I, I still think it'll help when it's warmer. And then we started adding micro C, and I think that's pretty pretty clear that there is a there is a drop in effluent micro C and in oh the green dots are um, trained for nitrate nitrate probe results so definitely within the process trains there was a, a significant drop when micro C was added and it looks like concentrations has climbed a little when the dose was lowered um, the very last period when alum was added to it there's not a lot of significant change it looks like Maybe nitrate was or nitrogen was a little lower, but for the most part, I find this data somewhat inconclusive, especially since the nitrate probe decided to do something odd here. That wasn't um, valid data for for that tail end of 2018. Looking at 2019, data looks more conclusive, and here you can see that the red dots, which were energy lab um, results of composite samples of the effluent are fairly consistently above and at a consistent interval above the nitrate probe. And this would make sense. So the nitrate probe only measures nitrate, whereas the total nitrogen in the effluent also includes, it includes nitrate. Should there be any ammonia left over, it would include that, but it also includes non-biodegradable nitrogen. And there's always some of that in wastewater. And for butte, it looks like it's on average about one or a little over one milligram per liter, which is pretty low actually. So in 2019, we start out with actually really nice values before any chemical addition. You can see effluent nitrogen is below 2.5, which is really good. Micro C definitely lowered it right here. Letting off the micro C, it went higher again to kind of the pre-chemical addition levels, but then it climbed again with alum addition. So maybe, those higher values in 2018 in the beginning did have something to do with this alum addition, especially at the high dose. And one, one of the, uh, the, the, the things that we're hypothesizing is that we're actually removing, so the alum is added to remove phosphorus and it's possible that the phosphorus is getting removed to a point where it becomes a limiting constituent. And so, the the bugs that do the nitrogen removal don't actually have enough phosphorus, like they're missing a vitamin. So they're not getting quite the nutrition they need to grow as fast as they otherwise would. And it might hamper their growth a little bit. Not too bad, we're still below th three milligrams per liter, but that is possible here. As we drop the alum, the nitrogen removal performance got better again. But then when we added micro C, no change happened. That's kind of surprising. I would have thought it would drive it down lower. And again, maybe maybe we're still removing too much phosphorus. I'm not sure. And then as chemical addition stop, levels drift up again. So then next we'll look at 
those same two years and same chemical addition scenarios for phosphorus. And this one is kind of interesting because, again, there is no chemical addition here. And look at how low some of these levels are, and we'll see those in, in the following two graphs too. Um, so so there, there may be some magic possible without chemical addition that definitely warrants further exploring. Then these scenarios for alum addition look pretty good. This is a little high. These two dots were from early in 2018 with those high flows. So I'm not sure how much value I give those. These two dots will show up again, and I will talk about them again. They, they keep popping out. Um, but here's micro C addition. Let's see, four, five, and six is my micro C addition. And that also yields a very good phosphorus effluent concentration. And these last two add micro C and alum, and they're also nice and low. So let's see what that looks like here. Here was alum addition in early, the, the beginning of the season in 2018 with these two higher values. And I ascribe that to this high flow right here. Now with flow settling down and the alum dose getting higher, the uh, effluent phosphorus concentrations dropped. Then we stopped dosing alum and it jumped up. Now this isn't a terribly big jump we're still less than 0.3 milligrams per liter over here, but it is, it's a pretty notable jump. Um, then we add micro C and it drops back down and it stays down all the way through micro C and micro C plus alum addition. Looking at 2019, going into the nutrient removal season, it's actually showing really nice um, effluent phosphorus concentrations at less than 0.4 milligrams per liter. Um, and that's without paying for a chemical. Adding micro C drops it again, just as in the year before. Curiously, it stays down during the next two weeks where there was no chemical addition. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe the process, the, the BioP process was so well established that it was able to hum along. Maybe during that time, the, um, uh, the, 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 nitrific, the denitrification in the anoxic zone was still just denitrifying enough that that first zone stayed anaerobic enough to keep facilitating phosphorus removal. Now, adding alum right here really barely lowers these concentrations more. I mean, it's, it's very little, and at this scale, it's hard to see. And then adding micro C on top of that doesn't do a whole lot. But curiously, when alum addition stops right here, we get two really high. The first is high, the second one already a little bit lower, effluent phosphorus concentrations. And these concentrations are actually at about the level of what the plant was producing before the upgrade. So that makes me think there was no biological phosphorus removal happening. And that could be because too much phosphorus was removed chemically and it stopped the biological phosphorus removal process altogether. But the bugs were still in the system. And after a couple of weeks, and the micro C may have helped in, in getting back down here, the, the BioP process reestablished itself and we're back to below 0.4 milligrams per liter. So to recap a little bit, alum does reduce effluent TP, we showed that, but it may remove too much of the phosphate from the process. And so phosphate can become the limiting nutrient for all the other bugs doing nitrogen removal um, and could hamper their growth. And so, and so we, we may have th the increase in effluent nitrogen during times of high alum addition may have been due to that. It is speculation. They're just ideas at this point. Um, it's also possible that if it's too much alum that it stops um, BioP removal altogether, or at least reduces it to a point where it takes a little while to rebound, um, simply because there isn't enough phosphorus there for those, those PAOs to, to store phosphorus and release it. Then we have, we've also shown that micro C, yes, it does reduce effluent TN, but it also seems to reduce effluent TP. Um, 
there had been I, I had read reports of that elsewhere and I was really curious to see if that would happen happen here in Butte too and it did and the most likely cause is that that micro C that makes it into that first anaerobic zone acts as PAO candy and so it, it increases the food available to the PAOs in that first cell and so it stimulates biological phosphorus removal. And if we combine the two chemicals, we really do not see any additional removal. So we conclude that micro C alone is effective in reducing effluent nutrient concentrations when compared to no chemical addition. But if we look at the differences, so total phosphorus, and these are all effluent concentrations, without chemical addition, we can probably get about 0.4 milligrams per liter. With chemical addition, we can get to 0.1 or less than that. In some cases, it was 0 0.0 something, 0 0.01, um, but on average is less than 0.1. For total nitrogen without chemical addition, we can reliably get below three milligrams per liter. With chemical addition, we might remove on average another milligram and a half. So there is the question, is, is that additional reduction in nutrients worth the cost and environmental impact of manufacture and transport of the chemicals? That is an entire study in itself because it would have to look at health of Silver Bowl Creek. It would have to look at the effects of these nutrients on Silver Bowl Creek and what are the costs associated with them. And then obviously look at energy costs, transport costs, and simply the costs to the folks of Butte Silver Bow for these chemicals. But all of that, and I was gonna bring us around to Silverbow Creek because that's really what all this is for. We're trying to return a creek that's been uh, not so healthy for a very long time to a healthy mountain stream where kids can go fishing and people can recreate and wade in it and not have to be afraid of something in there that's not very or less than healthy. And so here's a, qu a quick look at what this new process has done compared to the old. So the green and blue haystacks right here, they average at just a little above 15 milligrams per liter. That is nutrient data from 2001 through 2015, or total nitrogen data, I'm sorry, for the effluent. And then the reddish colored lines are for 2016 through 19. And so you can see that's a pretty marked difference from about 15 milligrams per liters on average to less than three. Phosphorus looks similar. These haystacks are more erratic, but the average for the old process was at around 1.8 milligrams per liter. And so you can see the red line for um, 2016, and it's this one right here. That one is actually still high. Um, there were only two process trains in service, and so um, at that point, there was no phosphorus removal. But then for the following three-year, phosphorus was pretty much below 0.5 and, and, and lower. And when we look at that on a load basis of what we're discharging to Silver Bowl Creek, 2015 was still the old process, discharged about 665 pounds per day on average. And comparing that to what we got for the last two years, that's an order of magnitude reduction right there. And it's similar for phosphorus at 56 pounds per day down to somewhere between 1.8 and 7.4. The average between those two is also pretty close to an order of magnitude reduction for total phosphorus. So it is, it is significant. And I have been told anecdotally by some folks that do downstream river sampling that they have seen positive effects from that reduction. So that is very encouraging. And then here's this slide. Um, this one is a historical photo of Silver Bowl Creek. Uh, shows lots of metals in those soils. That's why nothing is growing there. And it was used in a slide by Joe Griffin in a, in a presentation last spring for the Health of Silver Bowl Creek Symposium. And I have stolen it and used it here. And maybe he's listening. And thank you, Joe. Um, for over 100 years, that creek looked like this. Um, and metals were. In ultimately in large part to blame. And so they still show up in the influent for the plant. And while the plant wasn't this, or while this new process wasn't specifically designed to remove metals, 
we were pretty sure that it would do better than the old process at getting them out of the wastewater. And so there's a couple of things. This new process operates at a much higher um, mixed liquor or biomass concentration. There's simply more biomass in every cubic foot in that new process than there was in the old process. And so there's more solids that metals can absorb to, and these bugs do use the metals like a vitamin, just like there's copper and centrum or whatever that vitamin stuff is called. So they, they, they use these metals as vitamins too and, and simply incorpor incorporate them into their cell mass. And so then having that process followed by ultrafiltration is great because that ultrafiltration is really good at filtering out all these, well, the biomass, of course, but also even smaller particulate metals that might still be floating around in the water. And so a quick reminder of the numbers, the metals data we'll look at is 20, or from 2007 through 2019. Um, the influent that the plant is, has been seeing on average is about 99 milligrams per liter for total recoverable copper. And the water quality standard for Silver Bull Creek is 14 to 22 for chronic and acute standards. And then for zinc, the influent is 295 micrograms per liter. And the water quality standard for both acute and chronic is 180 micrograms per liter. And we're taking a closer look at copper and zinc just because these are the two metals that have been traditionally above, near or above the water quality standard in Butte's effluent. But first, a quick look at a number of them. Um, these are influent metals to the plant. And the main thing I want to point out here is how they haven't changed. So zinc, pretty much, pretty much level. It might actually be a little higher here, but here's copper, not a lot of difference. A lot more data available here, but let's see lead. Maybe it went down a little bit. There's a drop in some metals right here in 2012 because the lab reporting limit went got lower. So where prior to 2012, everything was reported at this reporting limit, it got lower and now it's reported here. So if there were lower values here, they're not captured. This is mostly true for molybdenum, molybdenum arsenic, and cadmium. Now effluent's more interesting in two ways. It's interesting that some metals did not respond to the new process at all, while others did respond very well. So again, this drop right here is due to a change in uh, laboratory reporting levels in 2012. So we'll ignore that and we'll look at zinc. Uh, pretty much flat, but copper market drop right here. Molybdenum and arsenic flat. Mercury market drop right here, and the, uh, not mercury, sorry, cadmium. Mercury right here is pretty flat too. Now mercury, molybdenum, arsenic, and cadmium actually have been below the in-stream water quality standards, so they're not, they will not be included in the new permit but copper and zinc will be. And so we're gonna take a closer look. Here's copper. Again, influent pretty much level, but effluent clearly shows a drop with the new process. And it actually starts in 2016 when the first two process trains were taken into service at that higher mixed liquor concentration. And here's a closer look, and this shows uh, dissolved and total recoverable co copper. So blue and green are influent. and this graph shows pretty nicely that the process reduces both dissolved and total recoverable, which includes all the, the particulate copper in the influent to below the water quality standards. What's shown here is the chronic standard at 14, and then the acute would be even higher at 22. For zinc, unfortunately, things look pretty flat. Um, both influent and effluent, not really any change. There were a lot of higher influent values in um, 2018. And you can see the spike here. And that actually was also right here. The copper had that same spike. We think that was due to that very wet year that I pointed out earlier. Um, there was a lot of rain, a lot of runoff, surface runoff into the sewer. And 
it's very likely that this simply entered the sewer with, with dust and, and particulates that are all over Butte. So here we can see that influent total recoverable is pretty high and gets removed very nicely, but the influent dissolved is at the same level essentially as, as the effluent dissolved zinc. And when looking at, at the data, at the numbers itself, it actually looks as though maybe even some of the influent um, total recoverable zinc, some of the stuff that's maybe in particular form, may be converted to dissolved effluent. It's not clear, but it's possible, and it's disappointing that it's not being removed better. However, the discharge is below the water quality standard. So that's the good news. And it has been consistently below the water quality standard since, since 2017. Um, here's a quick uh, pound or a mass space comparison. So 2007 through 15, copper at, was discharged at about 30 micrograms per liter, which equates to about 0.9 pounds per day. Um, the 16 through 19 average is only 6.9 micrograms per liter, and that equates to 0.22 pounds per day. For zinc, uh, it actually looks slightly worse. That's just how the averages work, but um, basically there's no change for, the, for zinc. And bringing us back around to Silver Bull Creek, this was um, a rendering published in the Montana Standard in 2016. Folks have been dreaming about restoring Silver Bull Creek to, you know, to a place that, that, that people can hang out at and play without having to be afraid of getting copper poisoning or similar things. Um, at one point, it looked pre pretty unlikely that that would happen, but I think it's quite possible at this point. Um, there's, there's other politics involved that I won't go into. Um, and I think that the plant, the wastewater treatment plant has done a great job to contribute to returning that stream back to back to a healthy mountain stream that folks can use and recreate and fish can grow in and that provides just a better quality of life there. And with that, I will turn it over to the questions that you guys can type into your chat box. Um, don't be shy. And I will answer whatever you throw at me. Yeah, thanks, Rika. Uh, yeah. Please submit your questions, as Rika says, in that uh, webinar control panel. So we've gotten a few questions in, Rika. So um, maybe starting off with the first question, why did biological P not get established when only two process trains were in service? Um, essentially, the volume is too small at this point. So you need a certain process volume for your, your anaerobic zone, a certain volume for your anoxic zone, a certain volume for your, for your aerobic zone. And if the total volume doesn't add up, these processes spill over into the next zone a little bit. And so having only two trains, it was they were essentially not providing enough volume, enough HRT to establish a biological phosphorus removal process. So when that third process was taken into service at the end of um, 2016, that provided that additional process volume that allowed all these processes to establish themselves fully. Kind of a couple questions related to the metals. Um, first of all, do you know where the metals were coming from in the influent? Um, the, the easy answer would be from all over Butte. Um, that's the quick answer, and, and simply because of the mining history and, and current mining, I mean, that it's quite possible that even just the dust contains some metals. Um, a lot of it is still in soils, and um, there's ongoing work being done by, by wet water environment technologies in trying to identify which um, collection system, like drainage areas, may have higher a higher incidence of, of maybe zinc or copper or other metals, and then to see if they can pinpoint that and, 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 and find locations that might need to get treated so that if there is an INI &I event or, or a, a runoff event, um, that, that these metals don't get carried into the sewer as much. But it's, 
it's detective work and it there it's almost finding like a needle in a stack of needles i mean it, it's it's not easy to to figure that out in butte I guess along another question kind of related to the metals with uh, with the greater metal removal by the new process, is that impacting their sludge disposal and, and what they do for sludge disposal? Um, it has not, and it's not expected to. Um, these quantities of metals are actually, and, and we have done the math, math, they're actually not nearly high enough to um, not not even remotely high enough to reach the sealing concentrations that are given by the the 40 CFR 503 regulations. And I mean they they continually um, test their sludge and it, there's it hasn't been close to any of those. So no, it hasn't. That metals removal has not affected um, sludge management. And is the metals removal something you see year round or is that specific to the summer months? Uh, the metals removal does occur year round and there is year round data available. Um, and so, yeah, and, and right. And the data collection was actually ramped up in 2018, I believe, um, largely in response to a permit application with DEQ because DEQ wanted to see have more data points available to see what the plant was capable of so they have a better basis on which they can develop their final effluent limits. And that's actually, their permit should be in process or maybe next month they'll, they'll get to that. All right, great. Well, that kind of uh, is the questions that have been asked. Um, so we'll kind of close it out with a few reminders here. So again, um, slide deck will be out on m-m.net. Um, and if you're looking for PDHs or CECs, uh, remember to email uh, Jenna Comstock and her email address is jcomstock at m-m.net. And our next webinar will be on Thursday, May 28th at 12 p.m. Uh, it'll be reviving the heart of a collection system, Reserve Street Lift Station. Um, I will be giving that presentation, so you won't want to miss it. And finally, we would love to hear from you. So please stay in touch with us on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thanks for tuning in today. We uh, hope you can join us next time. Until then, be well and be safe. Goodbye.